Hello! It's almost the end of the day and we have one awesome talk left. Celia Hodent, PhD, who is an expert in games UX as well as cognitive psychology, is here today to talk about and answer our questions. A little bit more about Celia. She is a consult consultant, speaker, and acclaimed author of two books. First, The Gamer's Brain, how neuroscience and UX can impact video game design, and the recently published The Psychology of Video Games. Welcome, Celia. Thanks, Anna, and hi, everyone. Uh, I hope everybody is uh, doing well and staying safe. Um, it is weird times, and I'm really happy to be uh, with you today. We're really glad we made it out. Uh, we made it work. Uh, it's morning there, and it's evening mm -hmm. here, and mm -hmm. you couldn't be live on the day because of the time zone differences. So I'm really yeah, I'm in recording. California, so yeah, we have nine hour or eight or nine hour difference. I so it was complicated. Yeah, it's, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. We had scheduling difference uh, difficulties because we weren't sure of the time differences. T daylight savings. Yeah, time, so. exactly. Daylight savings is not good UX. <laughs> no. But yeah, we've got tons of questions from our community, which is great. So how about we just jump right in? Yeah, let's do it. So you've worked internally to different game studios as well as an independent consultant. What are the biggest differences between them? Does anything remain the same regardless of where you are? Yeah, so some things are the same and some things are different. Um, so I, as an employee, I worked in um, four different studios at Ubisoft Paris. Uh, I worked at Ubisoft Montreal. Then I worked at LucasArts in San Francisco and at Epic Games in North Carolina. Um, and the common uh, ground in, across all these studios is um, I, you know, I was hired to bring um, either knowledge from cognitive psychology or neuroscience, which is actually more cognitive science, um, or to uh, advance the UX maturity or boot up the UX initiative mm -hmm. uh, in a studio, just like at LucasArts or uh, Epic Games. And so the common ground across all these things is, is typically it's it's you have to advocate for it. Uh, so yes, you were hired by someone, but then you have to work with other people that don't know who you are, where you're here, where you know what is UX. And you know, back, you know, uh, like ten years ago, there was a lot of questions like, why do we need a psychologist in here? <laughs> like, um, and so there's a lot of uh, try to convince and uh, show that uh, hey, uh, I come in peace, you know, and I'm here to uh, design for you, and I'm, I'm just here to help you accomplish your goals. So there's a lot of advocating and and listening and and um, making sure we can work together. Um, whereas as a consultant today, uh, typically when I'm cold, uh, it's oftentimes as, as the team itself that um, I've heard of my work or you know, they, they understand UX better because, you know, 10 years after, <laughs> hopefully <laughs> there's a more understanding of UX. And and so I don't have to do that much convincing. It's it's more I can jump right in to help them out um, because the people who need still need convincing, they're, they're not <laughs> hiring me to consult at, at their studio. So it's, it's a little bit, the dynamic is a bit different. Um, but then what remains the same is we all have the same challenges trying to figure it out. Um, and I see a lot of, uh, whether in consulting work or whether I was uh, working as an employee, I, see, I still see a lot of uh, um, uh, difficulty communicating inside a team and uh, to stay focused on what experience are we offering to whom. And, and that remains um, the same. So the challenges are the same, uh, even across countries, because I've been doing consulting work now. I'm, I'm super privileged to be able to travel, I mean, bef before COVID, of course, mm -hmm. uh, to meet the people where they are across, uh, you know, a lot of different countries. Um, and it's interesting to see that everybody has the same challenges. I mean, it's, it's just so hard to stay focused on what you're trying to accomplish, to stay on, on track. Um, so, you know, that's the great thing. What I'm missing is, is being able to work closely with one team and, and just to see, you know, uh, that, th that baby taking shape and, and then being really still a well, that's, that's something I miss. Um, but you know, I'm glad I can meet with so many different people, uh, today. So that's a cool part. Yeah. It must be really cool to see both sides and kind of mm -hmm. experience both of them. I can't complain. It's a very, <laughs> very cool job. <laughs> no, really. Um, speaking of your cool job, the gamer's brain covers a lot of theory about uh, a newer science. How do you apply psychological concepts and move from theory to action with studios? Mm -hmm. And what's the thought process of design process that UX teams can use to really apply them? 
Yeah, so that's a great question because uh, <laughs> there's always a big gap because in between theory and practice. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, in the gamer's brain, I mean, I, there's two main parts. Like the first part is is more about how the brain works and and what is uh, motivation and emotion, and then the second part is more like, okay, what is the framework that we can use uh, so that we can follow it uh, so we don't forget anything. Um, so it's just the the process is is uh, is, is a lot of thing. Um, so having a, like a design thinking process, um, when you whereby you just start by pausing your hypothesis, trying to solve uh, for a problem, and you know you iterate and you empathize with your audience, and and then you prototype and you test it out and. And then you see what's going on, and then you uh, you uh, tweak your prototype, and you go through that loop. Um, that's the process that we uh, cling on to because that's that's the one that really helps us uh, move forward and and and, and keep us on track of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and then we can. That's that's the reason why I uh, the um, the ingredients of game UX when I when I divide it into usability and gageability with you know like a, like a checklist this is really how i envision it and this is how it helps me like every day um sometimes I, i'm asked to do a ux evaluation of a game i put that in front of me so I, do, I don't forget what are the ingredients uh so of course you know we can use way many more heuristics but at least you know having these guidelines like very broad in front of me all the time i can always remember okay um what what is what are the usability issues in here and how do they affect motivation emotion or game flow so that i can um, have a better idea of the priority um so i hope that that i didn't make a, a, a too uh, a lousy job of, of explaining the process and how we can use that so that it's, it's not just theory as practice so that we can identify very early on what are the issues and more importantly, uh, understand uh, what are the, the more important issues and to prioritize uh, these things, because that's the main problem in the game industry, uh, in many industries, but in the game industry more specifically, is every, everything's on fire all the time. And so we need to <laughs> figure out what to fix first and what are the things that can be fixed you know, after the game um, is launched. Um, so yeah, I, just, I would say like the design thinking process uh and having like these ingredients all the time in terms of usability you know signs and feedback are they clear do we have form follows function and then how do they affect um the engage what i call the engageability um uh, part uh, regarding human motivation and emotion and game flow that's that's really I, I use that all the time so just to remind myself of of what is what is important where we're trying to to go now that's a great answer. It's difficult to answer, and it depends on your understanding of the <laughs> concepts as well, right? So yeah, and it depends on the project. It depends on where we're at in the process. So that's the reason why I'm giving a very broad answer. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully, you know, that's that's by it's just really the 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 mindset and uh, UX. I I say that all the time. It's it's a mindset more than anything. So if you have the mindset, uh, then at every step in the process, you can just stop and think and like, okay. Uh, is, does this make sense for the experience I want to offer to this audience? And and uh, what are our assumptions and how can we verify that our assumptions are true and interesting? Yeah. Step by step, <laughs> get there. Yeah. And also, as always, experience helps. But you have to start somewhere and the checklist is a really helpful tool. Yeah, absolutely. And I am even like I'm starting to have a lot of experience, I still verify and i'm still every time i look at my list like did i forget something because <laughs> i know i can't rely on my memory mm -hmm. uh so we have to check on our biases it's it's that's the thing so when you start to be good good have experience in any um discipline you, you you rely too much on your intuition and this is when you know biases can kick in yeah. uh they can kick in if you don't know too much about a discipline so because you're too new and so you're not aware of many things but at some point you know when you feel that you're confident in your skills this is also when <laughs> mistakes can kick in and and you fail to notice your biases especially confirmation bias um so i would say you know even with experience uh it's important to check your own biases and make sure that you're not too confident <laughs> in your skills and and you you check on yourself yeah that's another take on the have a beginner's mindset i guess <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah 
Speaking of beginners, this is a great segue. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> For newcomers to the field of games user research, getting into games user research seems to get harder every year. What can new talent do to try and enter or transition into the industry today? Yeah, I have that I get that question a lot. Yeah, I know. Um, so <laughs> I wrote a big blog post on my website. So if you go to celiahuden.com, uh, I think it's it's probably one of the top ones because I think it's the latest one I wrote or uh, I don't remember actually, but uh, yeah, I'm, I, <laughs> but I know the blog posts I want to write. But anyway, uh, I and I made, I explained all this in detail. Um, so yes, it's, it's, I would say it's harder in one sense, but it's easier in another sense um, because now it is a thing. And now we have a community that we didn't have before. Um, and so things are, are, are more established and, and and so it's easier in that way and you can also rely on the community um that we have like now we have a strong community so that's that's really cool um but the main thing is is to reach out to people the game industry it's it's still small in a way uh and it's a little hard to get a job just at, right off the bat and just by s sending a resume it's really important to network um so that would be the main thing and network and also produce stuff um so whether you're more into ux design or user research uh, it's it's nice to have a uh, website where you can just like show off your skills um and practice on you know if you like if you're into user research and like the last game you play and you, know, you can just like um uh, very respectfully because you have to be careful <laughs> not oh, yeah. to say well this game is shit. <laughs> so respectfully um go through it and, and explain what you identified as ux issues understanding also that you don't know what the constraints were on the team because you know there's a lot of things that we, we make compromises all the time mm -hmm. uh so sometimes we do know that this this was a compromise but we went for it because it was still better than doing something else um so anyway, there's trade-offs all the time, but as a UX researcher, you can uh, exercise yourself and, and and show off, you know, what what you can do. Um, and as a UX designer, you can also, if you haven't worked in a company before, you can again pick the game that you've played uh, lately and try to redesign a, a system that you th you think could be done better. So again, as long as it's respectful uh, and you clearly say, hey, this is just an exercise. Uh, I really love this game and I wanted to break it down. Um, then you can you have stuff to show off um, and then take part in the conversation and join the Grox uh, Discord channel. And and you know if you're here, you already know about the community. So it's, it's a, I love this community. It's really super welcoming and and um, open-minded. So that's that's really cool. I love that. Yeah. So that's my short answer. But then go go watch go read my uh, my blog post. There's a ton of um of um tips in there, and there's also resources they can uh, go check. Yeah, I'll make the link available somewhere so people can access it easily. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when I found the community and because before I felt very alone and then I found that, oh, no, there are tons of other people who feel alone, <laughs> like maybe in their studios, but then there are people who are doing this and many of them. So it's been really great. Yeah. Um, riffing off of that a little bit, um, going a bit deeper, what can newcomers from minority and systemically disadvantaged groups do in particular to break in? Yeah, so that's that's the part that is really concerning to me because we don't have a lot of um, uh, diversity in the game industry, um, and it's not getting much better. Uh, so it takes way more effort uh, for marginalized folks to get in, for sure. So um, my advice is going to stay the same in the and in, in the sense that you need to network, you need to find mentors. Uh, so again. You will be able to find mentors. There's a lot of people who are um, um, willing to help. So try to find someone who uh, you know inspires you or uh, that you think you can reach out to. Uh, of course, there's a lot of people busy, and it's, it's sometimes it's the wrong the wrong moment. But uh, uh, keep asking because you'll find someone who can help you out. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, orgs uh, that can uh, help out. So again, in, in my um, uh, in my blog post, I, I put a bunch of orgs that can help you out. And also you can check on the ethical 
uh, games.org. So this is an initiative that I've started with a bunch of uh, other people. Um, and it's all about raising ethics in games. Um, it's not just on the content side, it's also on, on the studio side. And so uh, like making sure the game industry becomes more inclusive is really important. So on that website, ethicalgames.org, um, there is a, a res uh, learn more or a, a, there's a page with more resources and you'll find a lot of orgs um, to help out on, and, and push forward diversity and inclusion in the game industry. So look at all these orgs uh, and then and reach out to them and join them because that, that's really going to be um, helping you out. So that would be my, my main advice. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Uh, I don't even know all the orgs. I know there are plenty under IGDA. Uh, recently, POC in play. Uh, the hashtag yep. has been really trending, and I yep. love it. It yep. it's no, no, so eye-opening, and yeah. So Twitter is another place yes. <laughs> you can go into. So I'm a bit biased because I love Twitter. So <laughs> I'm uh, I'm there all the time. But there's a lot of game developers on Twitter. Um, so artists are are also on Instagram, um, but game developers are are a lot on Twitter. So yeah, you can use these hashtags. Um, so again, you know, at, uh, on the ethicalgames.org, I link to, there's also a page on uh, uh, Yuki that there's, there's a listing all, all the orgs. So you'll have all that on, that spa on this page. Yes. Um, now I lost track of which question we're on. Just a second. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. For teams new to games user research and user experience design, their first steps are usually easy. Start with small studies and firefight. But mm -hmm. what kind of advice do you offer to studios who want to build a process for UX to help them for years to come? We had another talk on this actually by people who are actually living this right now, but you've been through it. So it's been interesting to hear your <laughs> take on it. Yeah, I've been through it twice. I said that the first time like at LucasArts <laughs> was a bit abruptly uh, stopped. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, so I actually, that was the, the main point of my talk that I gave um, at uh, uh, GIC, uh, so as how we advance UX maturity. Um, it's, it's very much what you were just saying. Like we, so we start by making sure like we understand, people understand that UX is, is here to help, uh, that UX professionals are coming in peace and, and we're not here to design for the designers, for the game designers uh, at least. And uh, we are all in the same boat and we're gonna um, move um, move forward together. Um, then you have the quick wins, like you were talking about. Um, so you focus on the people who are interested into UX practices and and this knowledge. So you can um, um, demonstrate quick wins by changing a few things, and you iterate, and then you test, and you retest, and you see it's getting better. And then other people are gonna say, "Hey, did you see what they did that?" Or and and then you know through word of mouth, it's getting there. Um, then what's going to be important is to have a common language. So that's the reason why I've. I insist a lot on these like usability and engageability um, uh, guidelines because these these are not really US six. It's more guidelines to have a common language at the studio uh, that QA people can also use uh, when they report bugs. They can they can also very very good at spotting problems. Um, so I worked a lot uh, with the QA teams on, at, at the different studios um, so that we can try to have a same common language across the board and um, making sure that like, every time someone is, is raising a problem, we can label it uh, with uh, the UX uh, vocabulary. So, so that it, when you label a problem and you explain, well, yeah, we have a problem because this is a form for a function problem, like, like people don't understand the functionality based on the form of um, the item. Uh, then, you know, at some point, it's, it's getting faster to identify problems and then it's faster to solve for them because people now understand what we're talking about and they understand the origin of the problem and because perception is subjective, blah, blah, blah. Uh, then it, it, you know, it starts to get faster then you need to establish a process. So this is the part that's a bit difficult because you know you need more people on board. <laughs> um, and the, uh, pairing with producers was really, really helpful. Like I saw a huge difference um, when I was working on Fortnite, now, even though you know, the core team was, was support on board, um, it was still hard enough after a test to 
um, you know, go through all the, the issues that we found and, and make the exact actionable. So this is when the, the work I did um, with uh, Heather Chandler, uh, producer at Epic Games, um, um, back in the day when it was when we were both there, and she was working on for on Fortnite. Uh, we did a talk back in the day <laughs> at, TV, at GDC to talk about that. Um, but she, I mean, she was super helpful because she established a, a, a production pipeline around these things to make sure like um, every time we had issue, like we could label them and then using Jira or you know, whatever you're using. Uh, and then there's a follow up and then it's, it's there's a priority assigned and it goes through, you know, the, the producer can define, okay, do we need to focus on the feedback from the UX uh, test or is there something more important that we do right now? Uh, that's fine either way, as, so, as long as we're all on board and we understand why. Uh, but then we need to figure out when are we going to address these issues uh, and who's going to address them and how we're going to fix them. And once they're fixed um, for us, we verify if they're fixed for the, the users, for the players. Um, and so establishing that pipeline and always having a hypothesis before testing and, and making sure that uh, the the team had a clear day on the day of the test so they could come down to the lab and, and watch what was going on. So yeah, building up a lab is is really cool to have because it's it's physically like being together in the same room. Mm. You know, we, we can feel that <laughs> with the, uh, the Zoom fatigue and, and the, the, the COVID. It's, it's great it's that real, we can yeah. we have technology to be together, but being in the same room and see the frustration of someone like really like, like literally feet away from us, it's really not the same. Um, so yeah, we can do it without it for sure. Uh, but that to me really was interesting um, to always have people come down and discuss and listening to discussion from um, uh, the creative director or um, um, our director or our lead engineer. So we, it was really a great moment where we can all sit down and take a look and discuss and, and why we were uh, thinking that things were going wrong. So that was great. Um, but then the last part is, to link that with KPI and to align with the UX strategy at the studio level. And that last part, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, it's it's really hard to get there. Um, so I don't, right now, I don't think I know any studio that got there for sure. Um, I, I, I'm very dubious that um, we have a studio out there. If you, if you believe at your studio, the, you're there and let me know, because that would be super cool. Um, but I don't think we're at the, you know, the level of the UX culture when business is aligned and we have to find our values as a company and uh, so that we can, you know, offer all that. Because uh, there's, there's a lot of focus on monetization and, you know, improving um, uh, economy and, and uh, improving revenues, which I totally understand. I mean, it's it's, it's all business. <laughs> But this is not what UX culture is about. It's not just about increasing revenue. It's about making sure we offer the best experience possible, and that uh, you know that the experience uh, that we offer is as as we always focus on on the user's best interest. So that part, you know, ethics and inclusion and all that, <laughs> accessibility. It's that's not. <laughs> I wouldn't say that we have a UX culture that is strong like that in any studio right now. Wait. Slowly, we're going to get there, hopefully. Um, but that last step is going to take a while, I think. Yeah, we've been taking great strides as an industry, late, especially lately. But there is no, still room true. to grow and ways to go, definitely. No, it's it's. I'm I'm not saying that everything's doomed. No, no, I'm no. super hopeful because <laughs> it has changed quite a bit, and now we we talk about more things. But we're still. I mean, there's still a lot of work to do. So, but it's cool. You know, it's it's cool that that we get to do that and, and to and to grow our um, the game industry. It is. And yeah, it's sometimes hard to straddle the line between like being too pessimistic and like reminding people that don't get complacent that they're still in the grow, <laughs> right? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking more about research and design differences, there is, uh, at least for some people and some roles and studios, a clear distinction between the two. Like, these are the mm -hmm. user researchers and these are the user experience designers. But even there, the line gets a bit blurry when people are asked to offer design recommendations. Mm -hmm. How do you find the line between suggestions or not? Uh, yeah, so that's the question. I don't know if you understand it. Yeah, but there, no, no, I do. I do. A second it's, part it's... 
is there a role for UX generalists or UX specialists in a game company? Like, how do you feel the roles are? Should they be separate? And yeah. Yeah. So I'm not. Yeah. So I, I, at least I can answer for the the part because I, I'm you know my my view is it's it's good to give some suggestions uh, so that it helps um, explain a little bit the issue better. Um, but I, it's hard to give suggestions at the very beginning um, because when you, the trust is not there yet, uh, because then you can step on, you know, um, you don't want people calling you the usability police or thinking that, oh, you know better than, than me, you know, how we should design it. Um, so, I mean, it's walking on the eggshells. So you have to be careful a little bit. Uh, but once there's trust, then it's much easier and um, um, at Epic, um, um, when I was leading the UX team there, I found it super uh, valuable to have UX designers on the team that were here to try to prototype things where we were seeing that that was not working well um, because the UX designer embedded on the team, they had so many things to do. And so it was just hard when you're, when you're in the tall vision and there's like so much shit <laughs> to get done uh, to be able to stop and, and, you know, iterate on something. Mm -hmm. And that can be frustrating for them because they uh, typically UX designers, they love to do that. Um, but so it, it's also hard. You don't want them to be frustrated when we do the cool part of you know, trying to figure stuff out. Um, but the idea is also to help them out. Uh, and so as long as you do that in good intelligence with these people so that you're not overstepping on their toes and and you clearly like you're asking, hey, are you okay if we try to iterate on, on both stuff? And then we, we propose a few things and then we can discuss with you and see what, what you think. Uh, so if it's done that way, um, I mean, of what I've experienced so far, it's, it's helping because sometimes um, the solution is easier to find from a team that's a bit outside because we don't have as much pressure and uh, we're not as much as in the tunnel vision sometimes as the UX designers embedded on the team. So I hope that answers a little bit <laughs> the question. Uh, and I think it's valuable to do that, but there's a way to do it correctly so that people don't feel that you know the the part that is fun for many UX designers is is slipping away from them. Uh, so it has it you know it, it has to be done very carefully so it's it's not annoying for anyone. Um, and what's what was the second part of the question? <laughs> oh, the generalist. Um, yeah, generalist and specialist. Yeah. So uh, I consider myself more of a generalist, I, although I, I don't call it myself generalist. I call myself uh, um, a strategist, you know, strategist. <laughs> It's much more pompous, you know, I feel more important. <laughs> um, but I think there's value in, in, in both. Um, because again, when you're a specialist, you, you focus a lot on one thing and that's really important to have um, um, expertise in one element and you can you know, really dive deeper into that. But it's also good to have people who have more like a, a broad approach and, and to make sure that we stay on, um, on track on everything. That's uh, um, my friend and former colleague at Ubisoft, Jean Guédon, is uh, very uh, is very fan of of the zoom in, zoom out philosophy, and I found I found that very valuable. You know, it's important to sometimes you zoom in on something and you just like try to solve for a problem, but you it's important every now and then to take a step back and make sure uh, that everything makes sense uh, still. Because sometimes if we zoom in too much and we're expert in one thing and we just like like have our our you know uh, blind spots and and we just like focus on there. Um, um, then we lose track of where we were trying to go. And sometimes you wake up like, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Is this still really meaningful for our lives? So I found value in um, in both. I think there's, there's room for everyone, basically. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I think also it depends on the size of the team. So if there are more people, then it's there true. could be more specialists on different things. No, for sure. Um, yeah, you're not. <laughs> the smaller the team, you know, the more teams of one you have. And so you have to do it all. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, moving on, how would you describe the variety of research methodologies being used in game studios and what are the barriers that prohibit the use of more diverse research methods? Yeah, so it's not very diverse so far. <laughs> um, and, and I'm not sure it, we need it. Um, so, I, I mean, that's completely a subjective opinion. Uh, but I still find so much value in just like watching players um, and sending, you know, give them the survey so they can answer questions and we can figure it out. Um, biometrics, as, you know, as I start to uh, get in the game industry, um, 
mainly eye tracking, but I mean, it's things that are so fast in the game industry. It's really tedious to um, invite over a bunch of people and then have enough people to gather um, good data from tell me, uh, from um, not tell me your data from uh, biometrics. Um, and it's you know the cost benefit right now. It's it's it is interesting and we can explore things, but it's right now it's not the balance is a bit off. I still find it m much more viable um, to just stick to the um, the traditional like observation and, and just like survey people. Maybe because I'm getting old. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> it's just, I don't know. Um, but I, 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 it's, I, I still find it a bit hard to, to justify like the use of a lot of uh, uh, biometrics. So we'll see. And there's also at some point some ethical um, questions to, to raise. And like, for example, in France, it's, it's, you're not allowed to, um, to use like a brain imagery to, uh, for marketing or, or like purposes or business purposes. You can only do that for health purposes or educational purposes or like ad academic research because they, they're, they're raising concerns like, uh, um, you know, if you want to look into what is the emotional reaction in the brain when you have one scent versus another scent, and so we're going to use that scent in our uh, in our uh, uh, shops, for example, in our stores. As the French, you know, the, the French government was like, "Yeah, that sounds a little bit. Uh, you're really manipulating people." Uh, so the, the problem is that it's uh, <laughs> it's really tricky because we're, we're not we're not as good as understanding how the brain works. But I do understand, you know, the 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 ethical line that we need to think about. So with biometrics, we we do need to to think about that. Is if it's not really useful for gameplay, and uh, do we really need to use it? Um, so it's, I mean, it's a tricky question, um, but that's probably the reason why the, it's not it's very varied right now in the research methods that we're using. It's, it's still very traditional. Yeah, but they still deliver a lot of bang for the buck, like you said. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's still very useful to see someone frustrated uh, in front of, a, of, of, of an issue. And I don't need to know what is uh, the heart rate <laughs> at that moment because I understand that the person is frustrated. But again, you know, confirmation biases. And uh, I, I need to also take a step back in, into my position. And, you know, I, I, maybe at some point it's going to be easier to gather, um, like uh, using more methodologies. Why not? Um, but right now it's, it's just... Uh, the game industry is still, was still always running <laughs> and we still always have to do things like for yesterday. So it's, it's just hard in this condition to really uh, innovate in terms of, of research methodologies, I would say. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, when you see someone clearly frustrated, it's really like, it, it, it makes things really odd obvious but also i've seen my share of really stone-faced play testers who are just like oh, yeah. i have no idea what they're doing and that's when i think like wait no no yeah another way but you know you have to have a mix of both and as long as you test regularly you get what you need <laughs> absolutely okay we're down to our last two questions so where do you think teams should make compromises, balance in iterative redesigns, but also wanting to speed up the whole development process because of time, money, deadlines, or other restrictions? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. that's really very much what we do every day <laughs> in UX, mm -hmm. uh, especially in UX research. Um, yeah, so it's it's uh, what Ian Livingston was was uh, uh, calling uh, the good enough research, and when he did a talk at the the first Game UX Summit, I was like, oh gosh, it was in twenty sixteen, so like an eternity ago, uh, or twenty six. Yeah, anyway, um, yeah, we need to balance it out, and and that's the reason why UX has to be a mindset. Because if we're just like looking at the research and then you have all the, the priorities and all the things that we need to fix, uh, then it's very much, very overwhelming. And that's the reason why, you know, working with Heather was super useful be because every now and then we, we sit down and we're looking at uh, the all the UX issues that we had. And um, we also had that top five, the top five that we knew was affecting engagement uh, and, and not, you know, just a part of the process. So we were trying to find out 
what is affecting, for example, players' uh, competence. If players don't feel competent, it's very likely that they're not going to keep playing. And so we try to always like keep up this top five kind of thing and how we could solve for that to, again, have a, like a zoom out kind of thing instead of being overwhelmed by the hundreds of UX issues that we had to solve and, and how do we start. Um, so this is the, where the, the compromise is, is starting to um, take place when as a team uh, with you know UX expertise on one end and uh, the core team on the other end um, is trying to figure out, okay, what do we need to focus on? What is the degree, the um, most critical impact on the experience that we want to offer so that you know we can we can start to figure it out but if if you don't have like a production pipeline where um ux is really uh ux research is really embedded on in the process when everybody's on board uh it's really hard to do so that's the reason why it's really um I, I, I say that again and again. I, some people always ask me, you know, when is the good time to add UX in the process? Like UX is the process. <laughs> you don't add it at some point in the process. Uh, so having that UX mindset um, is what's going to help everyone to, to try to prioritize issues and find out what are, like uh, Don Norman says, uh, it's, it's not, you know, solving problems is not that complicated. It's solving the right problems that are complicated so finding what are the problems uh we need to solve and how to fix them that's 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 the challenge and we can't really do that if we're all working in a silo so that is a good answer <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> that's the only one i got so <laughs> um a lighter one maybe, or maybe a harder one at the end. We'll see how you find it. If you had a chance to give one piece of advice to your younger self, just starting following the user research path, what would that be? Yeah, it's not lighter. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it's, it's always really hard, um, you know, because of the hindsight bias. <laughs> but um, I, I would probably say to myself, you know, meritocracy is bullshit. Um, because you know, as as a woman, I had to work twice as hard as other some other people to you know have a seat at the table, and and I also realized that other people uh, that are um, more marginalized, it just that I'm white, so it's, it's not that hard. Um, I have to work twice as hard as I did to maybe not even have a seat at the table, uh, and and that's very frustrating, and so. Of course, if you don't work hard, you don't get anywhere. Uh, but it's it's that um, you know it's it's just hard to realize at some point in your career is like okay, so it's not enough. It's not enough to prove yourself time and again, um, and to try to never make mistakes, which we do. Um, but you know, the more marginalized that you are, uh, the harder it is to recover from a mistake. When you can see like like people are. are, are um, more included in the process, they can make mistakes, and and we should be able to make mistakes. But that's a problem, and 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 so meritocracy is not a thing, and we need to all acknowledge that, um, and to help each other out when we see that this is happening. I mean, again, it's easy to say, oh, poor me, you know, I I worked hard, and look at the others, and and you know, when you do that, you lose sight of the other people that work even harder than you did and they're not even like at the seat that you're 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 saying oh i should i should, I should have a bigger a bigger sit, seat so um it's it's really important to to um think about this and to try to to open the doors and to include everyone and and make sure that every everybody can equally fail and and then work you know to overcome their failures so that we can all become better um and so yeah i'm, I'm sorry it's not <laughs> you were hoping maybe for a light answer it's not <laughs> no, i knew that it's not super light the way yeah so so yeah but it's so important to to work hard is is i only uh, yeah it's, it's really important to try to, to stay on track of, of what we're trying to accomplish, but it's also important to remember that you know when you work for a company, it's it's not your family. Yet. And yes, I, I'm sure I, I love a lot of people that I work with, um, but when you work for a, a company, it's it's not working with people. And in a sense, I'm I'm really. Um, 
privilege to to be able to work as a consultant because now I can focus on the people rather than the organization. So it's it's that's really the part that I love uh, about consulting. I, I work with people. I don't have to take part into the politics of a specific system or you know to think you know I, someone's going to backstab me or whatever. <laughs> Maybe that happens anyway, but I I can't even see it. So. <laughs> You know, I'm True. peacefully unaware of that, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's 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 this. Uh, so it's important to focus on the people, uh, and to and to remember that that um, you know there's stuff in the society that that we also need to fix. Um, you need to be wax the shit out of that. <laughs> it's not it's not good. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm very cognizant that I've taken up a lot of your time, and you need to move on really soon. So thank you, Celia, for taking time to answer our questions and. I hope Thank you so much. And soon later. yeah, thanks to everyone who asked questions. And, uh, you know, as always, I'm available on Twitter if you want to ask me more questions. And uh, yeah, I, I again, I, I love the, the UX community. I, I love the fact that we are always um, putting ourselves in, into into question and, and we are stop, stopping and thinking and uh, we are asking the hard questions and, and try to get better. So I, I really love uh, the UX community. So yay, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you.